Okay. Um, it is 7.01, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, my name is Jamie. I'm with the Howell uh, Carnegie District Library. Um, we are so glad that you are all here tonight. Um, our program tonight is scheduled to run until 8.30. Um, I'm going to be your tech moderator this evening. If you have any um, program, any uh, sorry problems, questions, any technical issues during the program, please use this chat um, to contact me, and I'll be monitoring that all night. Um, this program will be recorded, and the recording will be available on the library's YouTube channel soon after this live virtual program. If you do not want your video in the recording, make sure that your video is turned off, that there is a little red slash through the camera icon in the bottom left corner of your Zoom window. Um, ooh, so I think that is all that I had for you. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Bill, who is here with us, Bill Konkoleski. He is the state director of the Michigan chapter of the Mutual UFO Network. It's the world's largest civilization UFO research organization. Um, and his presentation tonight is going to be on Michigan's biggest UFO sightings from the 1950s to current day. So I hope you are all excited. I'm going to turn it over to Bill um, and we'll get started. Oh, thanks so much, Jamie. Um, as he said, I am the state director for Michigan's um, MUFON chapter. MUFON chapter. And hold on a second. Gotta share my screen too. And we are the world's largest civilian UFO research organization. We're in 40 countries and we have over 4,000 members. Slide show start. Okay. And um, as I get a few slides into the presentation, I'm going to switch over to um, uh, just uh, you'll just see the, the MUFON banner, and I'll so that way I can um, <clears throat> refer to any notes that I may need to during the presentation. And then I'll be back at the end um, to discuss uh, any sightings that you may have had yourself, any questions you may have, or any comments. Um, so I've been with MUFON now for 27 years. And MUFON's been around since 1969. I have not been around since 1969, but I have been around for more than half the time that uh, the organization's been going. Um, 16 years ago, I became, actually almost 17 years ago now, I became state director for Michigan. And I've done lots of presentations all over the place and um, occasionally have dabbled into helping out a couple episodes of some TV programs about UFOs on some of the bigger networks, broadcast and cable. <clears throat> the place that I always like to start whenever there's a discussion about the possibility of life out there in outer space is to point to the data that we currently have about the odds for there being life out there. Right now, one estimate is that there's about 300 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And there are some estimates smaller, some bigger. Um, that's just a good round number that I like to use. And so one out of six of these stars on average, they say uh, may potentially have a planet or a moon orbiting that star that can sustain life. And uh, it may not be um, on a full scale like we have here on Earth, but some form of life. So that means that there are 50 billion worlds in our galaxy alone, um, according to data from Hubble and Kepler, that may actually have life on it. And if there are 50 billion worlds that may have life on it, some of that life, uh, there is probably life out there, and there is probably life that has evolved to whatever degree, just playing the odds, I would think. But if that's not good enough odds for you, um, consider this. Here is a picture of, um, taken by Hubble, of galaxies out there in the visible universe. These little points of light that you see here are not stars, just stars. They're full galaxies. There are a hundred billion other galaxies currently visible to us. And if the Milky Way galaxy is average, having about 50 billion worlds on it, planets or moons that might have life, then that means we have five 
uh, to the, I think it's 21st power, yeah, um, potentially life-sustaining worlds just in the visible universe. That many worlds, and you think about it, are we the only planet that has life? And okay for those people who just aren't impressed yet. Although we can see 100 billion other galaxies, the current estimate from Hubble is that there are actually 2 trillion other galaxies out there. 2 trillion galaxies alone. And not, not counting all the worlds in it. And uh, all the stars, all the worlds, any of that. So if there's 2 trillion galaxies out there, and if the Milky Way just happens to be average with 50 billion worlds, um, we have a figure here, um, one with uh, 23 zeros after it. It's so big, that's how I'm going to say it. So if this many potentially habitable worlds are out there in the universe, again, what are the odds that this many worlds could have life and yet there is only one world that actually does. Okay, so in walks this little thing called Fermi's Paradox. And this is the apparent contradiction between the high estimates of probability of the existence of extraterrestrial civilization and humanity's lack of contact with or evidence for such civilizations. In other words, okay, yada, 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 you tell me that there's all these worlds out there that could have life on them and that some of them have evolved into intelligent life and possibly space bearing life, uh, visiting other worlds. So if that is the case, how come we're not seeing any evidence of any of those civilizations visiting Earth? Kind of like, gotcha. But MUFON is, you know, we've been in this business quite a long time and we believe there's quite a bit of evidence that we're being visited on a regular basis. Just a, a few um, little bits of interest here. Um, the gentleman in the upper right hand corner is Dave McDonald. Uh, he is our current international director. He's in Kentucky. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, below him, is probably our most famous MUFON member. He's done a lot of television for us. We used to actually have our own television series, Hangar One. Maybe you've seen it. It was on the air for three seasons. It's a MUFON produced television series, all about UFO sightings. And we also have a big conference every year. Um, you see in the upper right hand corner a picture from one of these conferences. Or I should say, um, we usually do. Due to COVID, we weren't able to meet this year. And so our next conference is currently scheduled for next summer in July. It's going to be in Las Vegas, big name UFO speakers. And you could go to MUFON's website, MUFON.com, to find more about that. And then in the uh, upper uh, middle is a cover of one of our uh, newsletters. We put them out once a month and it has articles on the UFO topic and some of the best sightings that have come into MUFON. <clears throat> so how many UFO reports does MUFON get? The numbers that you see here are all individual UFO sighting reports given directly to MUFON. We don't go out there and cherry pick the internet and saying, oh wow, look at all these UFO sightings out there online. Uh, let's count that in our, in our tally. These are all people, individuals, giving us contact information to help them investigate what they've seen. So over a 10 year, the last 10 years, uh, we have here in Michigan over 2,500 sightings reported in our state alone to move on. And uh, the, the grand total in the next column you'll see, most of the, the sightings um, you'll see, notice it's, um, they've occurred in the United States, the number that's in parentheses. MUFON is based out of the United States, although we have chapters around the world. Um, obviously, the United States uh, is our biggest footprint when you look at the numbers. Other countries sometimes have uh, other UFO organizations that have uh, people reporting sightings to them. In the United States, um, in terms of doing investigations, there isn't anything remotely close to, to MUFON. And so, but still that means around the world, MUFON has gotten about 78,000 UFO reports over the last 10 years. That is a massive number. Now, not all of these are unexplainable. Uh, many of these sighting reports can be um, figured out if with enough research and investigation, we can at least 
can uh, explain away about 85% of what comes into us any given year. Um, sometimes that percentage is much higher. But there's always a few sightings that we can't explain. Now, the ones that we can't explain, um, they're often the ones that we can, yes, explain are like aircraft, celestial objects. A lot of times people will send in uh, pictures to us and say, I didn't see this thing in the picture when I took the picture, but now here it is. What do you think it is? Well, stuff like that. Um, you'll notice a couple if you're looking in the Michigan column, the year 2012 has a pretty significant jump in it. And the reason for that is a little thing called Chinese lanterns or sky lanterns. Basically, all you need is essentially a candle in a little plastic bag and you have an instant um, hot air balloon. And people see these in the sky. People were launching them in big numbers in 2012. It was a new fad. People were doing it, uh, although they've been around forever. It was a fad and people were lighting up these little plastic bags and sending them out sometimes one at a time, sometimes a few at a time, sometimes dozens at a time or more. Um, they're cheap and easy to operate and you just set fire to those, these little things and send them up. And when you see them in the sky, they look really strange. They, they flicker and they're silent. And if you see three of them in the sky at the same time, it kind of looks like a triangle. Hmm. Or if you see dozens of them in the sky. It looks like the invasion fleet is here. But they're just simply little plastic bags with candles. And after a while, people, after the fad died down and people were able to understand exactly what these things were, our next big jump in sightings, I think, was in 2015, where um, the new thing hit the sky, which is drones. <laughs> and right now, there are companies in Michigan, like the Firefly Drone Company, um, that put on fantastic, just amazing drone displays. Um, at some point, you should go over to their website and check it out, what they're capable of. And you know, then you'll see why a lot of people think these things are flying saucers. And um, now, in 2020, I know the numbers aren't up here, but uh, we have actually, at this point, already passed, we passed 2019 several months ago in terms of sightings. And the reason for that is the new thing in the sky, which is Starlink satellites. And these satellites are the invention of um, uh, the SpaceX company. Um, and that's um, an Elon Musk run company, same guy who does Tesla. And what he has in mind, this bright idea he has, is to launch these satellites up to give Wi-Fi coverage around the planet. And when you launch these satellites, you just don't want to launch one of them, you launch a chain of them. So when you see these things in the sky, you see these chain of lights. And right now, I'm not sure there's at least several hundred of those things up if they haven't hit a thousand already. I, they were right on the cusp of doing that last I checked. And his idea is to let up tens of thousands of these satellites. Uh, so another thing to check out on YouTube when you have the time, Starlink satellites, and you'll see why people think these are UFOs. And the reason that we have beat 2019 several months ago in terms of the number of sightings here in Michigan is, of course, because of these. And that's to the tune of roughly one in three reports uh, that we've gotten this year are these satellites. So that's a big, big number. Okay, so on to the, um, the meat of the, the presentation. Uh, this is some of the great UFO cases here in Michigan. Um, I'm gonna start off with the uh, 1953, it's known as the, the Kinross event, and then uh, move on to uh, the big sighting, the biggest sighting that's known here in Michigan from 1966 um, in Southeastern Michigan in 75, I'll discuss uh, where a UFO came down over an Air Force base in northern Michigan. And 94, um, I'll talk about uh, the west side of the state's biggest UFO flap. And then also, um, lastly, I'll touch on a sighting report that I did in Highland Township in 2004. That's my favorite personal investigation. So starting with the Kinross event, this one happened in 1953, November 23rd, 1953 to be exact, 
and it was at the tail end of the Korean War. And because of the war, um, up in the northern peninsula of Michigan, an Air Force base that we had up there, Kinross, was, on, was, was ready to go just in case anything should happen to Sioux Locks. The Sioux Locks, because the Sioux Locks are up, make possible, uh, uh, you know, important shipping channel um, through the country. And they wanted to, the U.S. wanted to protect that just in case the North Koreans would uh, do anything like try to blow up the Sioux Locks to affect U.S. shipping, things like that. And since it was only just a few months after the war, the base was still on alert and um, prepared to, to take action just in case anything should happen to the locks. When what happened was uh, on November 23rd, they're looking at their radar and they see a large object floating over the Sioux, which is the exact same thing, the very thing um, that they're put for, there for. So, they scramble an F-89 Scorpion jet um, and to go after the radar return that they're seeing. And as the jet takes off towards the Sioux locks, the object on the radar flies out into the middle of Lake Superior <clears throat> at about 500 miles an hour. <laughs> so the, what uh, follows next is the aircraft uh, chases the object out over Lake Superior. There's no description of it um, in radio chatter. And as the jet gets closer and closer to the object, the object pauses over Lake Superior. And then the plane and the object intersect, both in the same place at the same time, both disappear forever. One second, both are there. The next second, both are gone. No idea what happened to the plane no idea what happened to the object. Both gone forever. So the U.S. had to come up with a quick explanation of what happened. And so uh, much like you hear in South Park, uh, Blame Canada, they said uh, that a plane that was flying too close to our border um, set off the alarm and the alert. And that's what scrambled the jet out to investigate. But the plane that the uh, they said was out there, uh, the C-47 Skytrain is actually only uh, got a top speed of about 200 miles an hour. And the Canadians, of course, heavily uh, discounted any possibility that it, that it was them. They very clearly said that this was not their plane. And since the pilots were never found, um, the U.S. Dis um, declared them missing in action. And when they did that, um, unfortunately, since they were originally uh, declared missing in action and not killed in action, the families never got their due benefits. And the family of the actual uh, pilot, Robert um, Felix Makla, pardon me, his uh, radar operator on board was Robert Wilson. Makla's family um, put up a, a statue to him, a little memorial, and the, the placard in Louisiana says that he disappeared intercepting a UFO. So the family believed that it was a UFO that they encountered. And it, didn't, uh, it wasn't until the early 2000s where they were finally declared uh, dead and uh, the family got their benefits from it. Now, Project Blue Book is probably the um, most famous thing that the government has done with regards to investigating UFOs. I know that uh, there's uh, new projects that uh, have uh, come into the spotlight, but nothing really beats this project, that Project Blue Book, that lasted 17 years. Over 12,000 cases they investigated between 1952 and 1969. The Air Force um, has um, <clears throat> had different, they've had different investigations into the UFO phenomena. This one, um, certainly the biggest, and when it comes to a sighting that involves the Air Force itself, like the Kinross incident does, they are, of course, going to investigate it. So when they came out to investigate um, the Kinross event, they said, well, okay, so you saw something on the radar that you couldn't identify. 
And um, so what did the what did the actual UFO look like when you saw it? And nobody said they were able to see it. They just saw it on the radar. And they said, but a plane went out after it. Um, you know, they combined and on the radar and both disappeared. And to which uh, Project Blue Book said, well, if nobody actually saw a UFO, there's no UFO. All that we've got is that your radar is probably faulty. Forget about the fact that pilots were scrambled out and never came back. Um, that has nothing to do with UFOs, does it? Because, you know, again, nobody saw them. So that's how uh, Project Blue Book handled that case. And I think it's pretty indicative of um, how Blue Book handled many of their sighting reports over the years, very dismissive. And then um, what the Air Force itself did with this sighting is they said that it was a training mission. These pilots went out over Lake Superior and went down. It was probably a case of pilot vertigo. And what the accident report does not indicate is any indication that somebody might have seen a UFO. So Project Blue Book says there's a faulty radar, end of story. The accident report says pilot vertigo on a training exercise, end of story. And both leave out big chunks of the full details of what happened. In 2006, just when everybody thought this story um, was not coming back and nobody would be able to find anything in Lake Superior, a man by uh, the name of Adam Jimenez um, of the what he called the Great Lakes Dive Company said that they found the uh, the wreckage of not only the plane but of the uh, the UFO down at the bottom of Lake Superior, and they were claiming salvage rights. And that uh, when everybody um, uh, the next step that everybody should wait for is to purchase their DVD with all the details all about it that was coming out the next year. So what these guys didn't count on is the fact that they're very active and well-connected UFO investigators. Um, MUFON itself alone uh, was able to find out just within a matter of days that there is nobody by the name of Adam Jimenez, there is no Great Lakes Dive Company, and the whole thing was a hoax. And um, after that, the word got out that this thing was a hoax. Um, within two weeks, everybody, everybody, everywhere knew that there was nothing more to the story. And yet, um, yeah, it, uh, they were never found, the pilots, and nobody knows what happened. Moving down to um, the southeast Michigan area, um, this is often referred to as uh, the swamp gas um, event <laughs> uh, for reasons that you'll find out in a moment uh, if you're not already aware. Um, sightings were happening in large numbers all over southeastern Michigan, probably beginning late 65, going into 67. But the biggest concentration of them were in the spring of 66, particularly March of 1966. And the week, I'll only cover just one week of the whole event I, that I think gives a full picture. This week from March 14th to 21st, 1966, really takes the cake in, in this UFO event. So starting off in Ann Arbor, Michigan on March 14th, several hundred people, actually 100 plus um, witnesses that were on the U of M campus and surrounding area saw flying disks of several different colors, um, meaning that when they would see a disk, it was either black blue or they would see a pink disk or a green disk. These uh, several uh, co different colored lit up disks in the middle of the night doing wild aerial maneuvers over Ann Arbor. Now, since that many people saw these things between three in the morning and seven in the morning, that means that these things were very visible to the few people that were on the street at that time. And when we say we have this many witnesses, this, this, this many witnesses came forward and admitted that's what they saw. So there were probably many more witnesses than that, probably hundreds. So the other thing that happened that particular night was uh, Selfridge Air National Guard base also tracked UFOs over Lake Erie. 
And among the witnesses to the Ann Arbor event were seven police officers and sheriff's deputies from Livingston, Monroe, Washtenaw counties. Also the Hillsdale Civil Defense Director, William Bud Van Horn saw these UFOs. So we have not only um, your standard witnesses as a, you might call them, but with seven police officers, you have essentially expert witnesses because police officers, when they make it to the scene of an accident or perhaps a crime, what happens in court afterwards can depend heavily on their testimony. So they are trained observers and um, they also, um, their purpose is to keep the peace. So when it is, uh, when you hear things like, I'm about to uh, report here from Washtenaw County Deputy Sheriff Buford Bushrow, when you hear what he has to say about the UFO that he saw that night, uh, it's, it's kind of alarming. I, and I quote, he says, this is the strangest thing that we have ever witnessed. We would not have believed this story if we hadn't seen it with our own eyes. These objects can move at fantastic speeds and make very sharp turns, dive and climb and hover with great maneuverability. We have no idea what these objects were or where they could have come from. At 4.20 a.m., there were four of these objects flying in a line formation in a northwesterly direction. At 5.30, these objects went out of view and were not seen again. What he could have said was nothing. What he could have said was um, there have been people who have seen things. Uh, I might have seen something myself. I'm not sure we're looking into it. But instead, he goes um, and tells a really detailed account of what he saw that couldn't be anything else but potentially a flying saucer from another world. Now, um, Project Blue Book does become involved ultimately and they're not there yet. Um, J. Allen Hynek was the chief scientific advisor for Project Blue Book and you see him here in the lower right hand corner talking to two witnesses. These two witnesses are um, at the center of what happens on March 20th of that particular week. You have Frank and Ronald Manor. And Frank is uh, talking to uh, Heineck, and Ronald's on the porch, got his arms crossed. And they have a very unusual thing happen to them at night in that they have a UFO land um, at the edge of their property. That night, there are over 60 witnesses to uh, a UFO, group of five UFOs flying in a formation over Dexter, Michigan, when one of the UFOs out of the group of five descends and lands at the edge of the field of the Manor household. Now, <clears throat> the more than just Frank and Ronald saw it, some other family members in the house did too, but more interestingly, Dexter Police Chief Robert Taylor is among the witnesses to this landed UFO. He sees it coming down and he parks along the edge of the property and he's watching this from a distance. Also witnesses are uh, Washington County Sheriff's deputies Stanley McFadden and David Fitzpatrick. They were parked in a police cruiser on another edge of the property watching the landed UFO. And here is the police report that um, McFadden and Fitzpatrick took from the manors about the sighting. These two officers didn't uh, have a publicly available, made uh, publicly made available report of their own sighting, but they took the sighting information from um, the Manners. So they are um, all watching this thing, the Manners and uh, the two um, sets of police officers. When the Manners, uh, actually Frank and Ronald, get up enough courage to approach the object. And as they're walking closer to it, they see that it's about car length and it's uh, football or disc shaped and it's got a rough pitted exterior and it's got glowing red lights on the sides and it's kicking off this fog beneath it. And here in the left, you have uh, Frank uh, Manor standing, Ronald um, crouched over uh, basically in the area where they were watching the object. In the right-hand corner, I have this little Photoshop job done uh, that matches their description, hovering in a picture 
that's the actual spot of the landing. And I know it's the spot of the landing uh, because I visited the current resident of the home and they knew exactly where it came down and they walked me over and pointed to it. So <clears throat> this is an actual picture of where it went down. And when uh, Frank and Ronald got close to it, Ronald says, look at that horrible thing. And the instant he does, the UFO shoots away really quick buzzes over the car of McFadden and Fitzpatrick and shoots up into the sky. So if you ever have a UFO land on your property, um, they are very thin skinned. Uh, all it takes is a simple insult to them and they're on their way apparently. <laughs> so um, the um, Robert Taylor, he puts out um, uh, an announcement saying, okay, this flying saucer is, uh, you know, it's taken off and, you know, you know, everybody out there, see if you can see anything tonight. So on Island Lake Road, um, another object was spotted, or the same one, and a police car gave chase, called in other police cars, and eventually six police cars were chasing a UFO down Island Lake Road and didn't catch it. <laughs> Leading to the final night in this particular week, which, if the last night seemed uh, pretty strange, this one um, even tops that. So it's at Hillsdale College. Um, it's about 10.30 p.m., March 21st. And in the women's dorm, um, you see some of the women here in the lower left-hand corner. This was a shot done for a documentary about the event uh, done. It was a news piece back in the 60s. So these 17 young women all observed um, a disc-shaped object passed by their dorm. It said they had, it had red, green, and white pulsating lights. Now the key witness, uh, the one that was most talkative, uh, this woman named Gidget Cohn, who also worked for Hillsdale's newspaper, um, described the uh, campus newspaper, described the object, um, she said, as a flattened football. And um, she remembered that Bud Van Horn, the Hillsdale Civil Defense Director, had seen the object a week before. And so she decides to call him up and says, hey, you know, we've got this UFO on the far side of the campus. Um, <clears throat> um, no, we saw, we have this UFO that flew past us on the campus. And he said, okay, that, thanks for calling me. That's great that you remembered me. I'm very interested in this. If you should happen to see it again, please let me know. Well, all it took was about another half hour. At 11 o'clock, they called, um, she Gidget calls um, Van Horn back up and said it landed in the ball field about a half mile from them on the dorm. So um, Van Horn calls the police and says, you might wanna get out there. Um, there's apparently this UFO that's on campus. I'm headed there myself. He hangs up the phone. He drives directly to the women's dorm. The police do not go to the women's dorm. They fan out across the campus. As Van Horn shows up at the women's storm, and uh, he's greeted by uh, the Hillsdale assistant dean, Kelly Hearn, who's sort of the den mother of the women's storm, and 87 students, all of them, watching this landed object on the ball field with red lights, uh, with a red light on one end and a white light on the other. And whenever one of the police cars, because they could see the police cars moving around campus too, they noticed that whenever a police car or any car for that matter would get close to the ball field, the UFO would turn its lights off. And as the car passed by, the UFO would turn its lights back on again. I couldn't tell you why the UFO would even have its lights on in the first place, but uh, interesting that they were very aware of somebody coming by very close to see them and that they would uh, take an effort to hide. So <clears throat> they watched it um, bob up and down for a while and then slowly ascend into the sky and um, watched it jump around um, in the sky. It would sort of, rather than move really quickly, it seemed like it was sort of skipping across the sky, they described it. And um, after a while, once it was just doing its little flitting around job in the sky. Um, most of the witnesses went to bed. Gidget said she continued to watch until about 5 a.m. doing its maneuvers up in the sky. So the next day, um, since it is a college, 
um, they have a science lab and Van Horn decides that he's going to take soil samples and have the students do a test on them. So the soil samples, after they were tested, um, they did have readings of them that were interpreted two different ways. Um, one set of people who looked at the results said, oh my gosh, this radiation is off the charts. Um, something strange happened there. And another group said, no, uh, whoever was doing the, you know, the investigation, doing the testing, they really didn't know what they were doing and we can't use these results. So what you can't dismiss though, is that um, with the women in the dorm, Van Horn and um, Kelly Hearn, there were 89 witnesses to it landing. So um, there is no way that the Air Force's Project Blue Book is gonna be able to ignore this, and they send in somebody pretty quick. Um, here is an image of J. Allen Hynek, um, they're, again, their chief scientific advisor, doing a press conference at the Detroit Press Club on March 25th. This press club is still available on YouTube, um, or currently available on YouTube. And uh, so if you wanna watch it um, in, in its full entirety, it, it's there. So when, when Heineck was coming in to investigate the sightings here, he was told by the Air Force before he even got here that he was not to in any way give any indication that what people were seeing were, was anything anomalous no support whatever that what people were seeing were from another planet or, or unexplainable. Just go in and be dismissive and move along. And we know this because Heineck, um, after uh, Project Blue Book closed up in 1969, he was very open about it. Um, he told people <clears throat> uh, for years, even going so far as to starting up his own UFO research group in 1972, This. Center for UFO Studies, which is still around. Heineck is no longer around, but his group is. So back to this particular night of February, uh, pardon me, March 25th, 1966, since Heineck couldn't say that what people were seeing were maybe UFOs or flying saucers, what he had to say was something maybe believable, and he decided to go the swamp gas route, saying that what people, some of the people were seeing, especially in Dexter, was something low to the ground, might have been marsh gas or swamp gas, something like that. And the news jumped all over it. And the headlines in the paper, Air Force says UFOs are nothing but swamp gas. UFOs, nothing but marsh gas. And still to this day, when you read a cartoon uh, where somebody says, oh, UFOs are swamp gas, or you hear uh, somebody saying that, the reason is, is because of this exact event and what Heineck said on that, in that exact press conference. So this makes the Great Lakes, uh, Michigan, not only the Great Lakes state, we are also apparently the swamp gas state. Now, Heineck's letter, um, um, <clears throat> pardon me, Heineck's press conference led to a lot of letters to uh, people's constituents, you know, write your congressman if you're unhappy with the government, right? So people were calling, writing, and um, showing up at the, you know, the different places of their local elected officials throughout Michigan. And one of the congressmen that we had at that time in Michigan here was somebody who would go on to become president of the United States, Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford was a, a congressman at the time, and um, a lot of people contacted him and said, you gotta do something about this. We're being lied to by the government. We're being lied to by the Air Force. Something is wrong here, something's fishy. What are you gonna do about it? So what he does, what uh, Gerald Ford does, is he writes a letter on March 28th to the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. And the letter says, in the firm belief that the American public deserves a better explanation than that thus far given by the Air Force, I strongly recommend that there be a committee investigation of the UFO phenomenon. I think we owe it to the people to establish credibility regarding UFOs and to produce the greatest possible enlightenment of the subject. Whew, a lot from a guy who would become president and never mentioned UFOs again, huh? But uh, it, got his constituents off his back, and it actually worked. There actually was uh, a hearing 
um, that the Armed Services Committee put it together. And you notice this is March 28th. Things are moving along pretty quickly here from the previous week where all the siding activity was happening. So uh, not to get ahead of myself, but that slide. Um, on April 5th, 1966, the, um, the did, uh, Congress did have an open hearing last one day and Heineck was one of the people there to testify. Heineck was already impressed about the UFO phenomenon. And he was particularly impressed with what happened here in Michigan. He really thought that uh, something was happening, something anomalous, flying saucers were coming here, but he couldn't say that. And in fact, uh, the irony is, although he was a believer, if you want to use that term, he was being lampooned regularly for saying it was nothing but swamp gas. So his clever idea for this hearing was to say, on, and when he was giving his testimony, like, hey, you know, if you don't like what the government has to say, if you don't like what the military has to say, why don't you have a civilian group look into the UFO phenomenon? Wouldn't that solve things? And the Air Force says, that's a great idea. In fact, we'll pick out that civilian group that's going to look into this. And they did. So the Air Force they go to the University of Colorado and um, where they had uh, an ally in a man named Edward Condon who had ties to the military and government and is now running this college. The University of Colorado audits the Air Force's Blue Book files and comes to the conclusion there's nothing to this UFO phenomenon. Um, they even put out a book called The Scientific Study of Unidentified Flying Objects, which is still available on Amazon. And right here, you see Condon himself with a goofy looking flying saucer toy uh, atop a, a stack of papers as a paperweight. So since the Air Force was really only giving um, dismissive explanations of the UFO phenomena for 17 years, and they got an outside civilian group to agree with them, they said, well, there's no reason for us to be in business any longer. And um, in December, December 17, 1969, Blue Book closes forever. And, but still out of those 12,618 cases that they investigated, 701 of them still remain technically unidentified, which is a high number out of all the ones uh, that they tried to dismiss. So Michigan played a big part in UFO history with this particular investigation. And people still talk about this event to this day. Moving ahead to 1975, uh, Wurtsmith Air Force Base was a base that had nuclear bombers up until 93. Um, it's a civilian airport now. Um, and in fact, um, I was told by somebody that it may have actually closed down permanently now. But for a number of years, um, nuclear bombers on the base and on March, uh, October 30th, pardon me, 1975, <clears throat> a UFO came down and hovered over the weapon storage area. The guards around the weapon storage area reported this big, bright disk of a light hovering over them. And the air traffic tower was able to see it clearly, of course. And they even got it on radar, apparently, coming in. This being a place with nuclear weapons, of course, they're panicking. They don't know what to do. And this isn't a base that houses um, sleek, mili you know, sleek fighter planes. They have big whopping bombers there at the base. And um, <clears throat> in fact, they had a big whopping plane coming in for a landing, which was a KC-135 Stratotanker. Um, seizing on the opportunity of having a plane, any plane in the sky, um, they, they asked the plane, hey, do you see this big bright light over our base? And they said, yes, of course we do. And uh, the air traffic tower says, can you just move in a little bit closer and see what it does? <laughs> so taking their orders, they did move in closer to the big bright white light. And as they got closer to it, it shot off directly south. And the plane was ordered to follow it as long as it could, as far as it could. And so the plane heads down south into the crux of the thumb. And as the light that they're pursuing gets closer to shore, they lose it in the lights of the cities and everything on the shore. 
and they um, are told to turn back around. And as the plane turns back around, the light shoots up to them, this big glowing UFO, paces them briefly, and then shoots up directly into the sky. <clears throat> so what's scarier than a UFO um, descending upon a base with nuclear weapons is how about across a two-week period, four bases that have nuclear weapons buzzed by UFOs? So Wordsmith um, was kind of in the middle of this chain of events on October 30th, but Loring Air Force Base in Maine um, had a sighting on October 27th. The UFO came down over their base. And then following Wordsmith on November 7th and November 9th, Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana and Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota had their sightings too. All four of these bases, all with nuclear weapons, all a very similar looking UFO within two weeks time of each other. And um, even more interestingly, uh, this was not Milmstrom or Minot's uh, first UFO coming down over their base. So uh, the UFOs definitely seem to have an interest in our, our nuclear capabilities. Moving over now to the west side of the state in uh, the Grand Rapids area, um, loosely, you know, Holland up to Muskegon, that whole general area. They were reporting UFOs also um, in the month of March um, in 1994 in big numbers. The UFOs that people were seeing were very similar to the 1966 ones in that people uh, were seeing disc-shaped lights um, in different colors doing dramatic aerial maneuvers, sometimes, oftentimes, appearing in formation. And not only that, people were seeing much larger craft with lights around the perimeter too. For this particular sighting wave, which went on for some time, uh, the biggest night, hands down, for this sighting wave was March 8th of 1994. People reported UFOs that night. Over 300 witnesses that night alone reported UFOs in this um, sort of area here targeted on the map. Muskegon, Grand Haven, Grand Rapids, Holland, right in that area. And which led to uh, people calling the police. And a lot of these 911 calls uh, you can find on YouTube here. Um, if you go to Ottawa County UFO, I believe is the, uh, is the best search term to find some of the audio of these calls of people calling the police at night. And a lot of printed transcripts of the sightings, uh, of the reports to the police are also available online if you know where to look. And <clears throat> so a ton of witnesses, and of course that means police witnesses as well. Um, and um, in this particular case, um, people took pictures, people took videos, and they're pretty bad pictures and video. Uh, when you see one of the pictures, it's a black screen with the little white dot on it. Or uh, if you want to go to the videos, you see a black screen with a little white dot sort of zigzagging around and you don't know if it's what it is, first of all. You don't even know if the thing is actually moving itself or if the person can't hold their hand still. So the inconclusive is probably the best word for any of the photo photos and videos. And I just don't generally tend to go there with this particular side of the weave. But um, with all the witnesses, it got a lot of attention. Um, this is the, <laughs> the cover of the free press and the news and free press. Front page story, this, this particular night of sightings. We have in this picture, uh, the Graves family, uh, three of them anyway. The father, uh, Daryl, is not in the picture, but you see Holly and their two children, Joey and Michelle. Joey is 14, Michelle is 10. And the, this household of four um, had a UFO, a giant UFO in their backyard, uh, just uh, up in the sky, really big um, and with bright lights all around it. And they call the police. The police, um, <clears throat> listening to uh, what they had to say, said, oh my gosh, here is a case of one of these things that people have been calling us about all night. And in, in this particular case, we can actually dispatch an officer to it. The family described their sighting as a string of Christmas tree lights. And these are the sketches that they drew for MUFON. 
all of them pretty much in agreement in what they saw. The police send out um, Officer Jeff Belthouse to um, um, examine uh, what's up in the sky and uh, to take their testimony. And when he gets there, he very clearly sees it, obviously. And so uh, he talks to the family, pulls out his binoculars, and he sees not only just one of these things, but two of them up in the sky. He sees a second one actually behind it. And this is Officer Jeff Beldhouse's sketch here of how he described the, the UFO's departure. The red line I stuck on top of it. Um, so this is a report he did from MUFON. The UFO was at the Gray's family home and then slowly flew um, down the street. And as the UFO took off, Feldhouse hopped in his car and pursued it. Okay, so the police now have uh, people calling in as witnesses. They actually have their own officer now as a witness as well. And they are trying to figure out, okay, where do we go next with this? So the dispatch calls the National Weather Service in Muskegon and says, hey, do you have a radar that maybe is picking up anything unusual tonight? And it just so happens they are seeing the UFOs. Uh, Jack Bushong is the radar operator uh, for the National Weather Service at that time. And he says that usually if they get aircraft at all, and they usually don't, he says that they're usually little tiny pinpricks that disappear after a second. Their radar is not to, built to detect aircraft. It's built to detect weather. But Bushong says that there are three thumbnail-sized objects that he's catching on radar at that moment, and they are not going anywhere. So something very big is up in the sky that night, and he is seeing it on a radar that's not built to detect such things, but is, but it can't avoid seeing these things. And eventually these objects shoot out west over the lake at a speed that they estimate at about 3,000 miles an hour. All of them at once shoot out west in unison over Lake Michigan. They don't come up in Indiana or Illinois or Wisconsin, they're just gone. Um, so who knows if they went up, or down or simply disappeared, but nobody in any of the, the neighboring states reported the UFOs coming out um, in their, over their state skies. <clears throat> this being such a, a big sighting wave, uh, all sorts of UFO investigators were all over it, including the Center for UFO Studies, and, and uh, which is again, J. Allen Hynek's group. And Dr. Michael Swords, um, who was uh, an instructor at uh, Western Michigan University at the time. He is the one who goes to the National Weather Service on behalf of CUFOS, and he is doing his investigation. Now, uh, as you can tell from some of the other reports, MUFON is definitely all over this one too, but CUFOS manages, manages to get to the National Weather Service first, and they investigate uh, and they talk to Jack Bushong about his sighting. And uh, Dr. Swords from Kufos asks, hey, do you happen to have radar data from that night? And Bushong says, no, no, we don't really save our, our weather data. Um, and Swords thinks for a moment and says, well, how about this? Can we maybe do a series of sketches to sort of draw what you saw? And Bushong says, let me check and get back with you. Bushong checks, gets back to Dr. Swords and says, okay, we can do this. You and I will do these sketches that you're asking for, and there will only be two copies. The National Weather Service gets one copy, the Center for UFO Studies gets one copy, and nobody else ever sees them. And they both agree to that. And here are the sketches. I put red dots over the UFOs for visibility. Even at one point, uh, there's appears to, I'm going to run that a couple more times. Here it goes again. At one point, there even appears to be four of them, according to Bushong. And that sort of little jagged line you see indicates when the um, sighting return didn't seem to be clear so much as um, a scattered pattern. Okay, 
So if you remember what I said a second ago, National Weather Service gets one copy, Center for UFO Studies gets one copy, nobody else ever sees it. So you would think, um, a lot of people would think, have thought that the, the Center for UFO Studies just couldn't keep this information. They just had to get it out there. They, they couldn't hold on to it, it was too hot to handle. But no, it was actually the National Weather Service that released this because somebody did a Freedom of Information Act on the National Weather Service. Who knew you could do a Freedom of Information Act on the National Weather Service, right? So two weeks after these drawings were done, these sketches were out available to the public. And the sightings continued after that, but that was the biggest night uh, of sightings in that particular wave. Moving on now to um, what I will cover last here is uh, a sighting from 2004 that I investigated. Um, it took place over two days, September 29th and 30th in Highland Township, Michigan. Um, a gentleman called and said, that uh, he had a dramatic UFO sighting one night and even something more dramatic the next day. It was 2005 when he called me, March of 2005, saying what he was calling about happened six months earlier, but he was still shaken up about it. He didn't have to tell me he was shaken up. He was visibly, um, or I should say audibly shaken on the phone. Uh, he was really upset about what had happened to him and he really had to get it off his chest. It, it has been rare for me to speak with a witness who was this traumatized by their sighting. So I said, of course, I'll come out. And I brought a couple of uh, field investigator trainees with me. Um, we came out to his house in March. And, uh, and he said the first thing that he saw, he was driving home then, I believe the Hickory Ridge is the name of the road. And um, as he went around a slight curvature in the road, he suddenly found himself under a giant disc, a uh, giant triangle, pardon me, in the sky. And he said it had a big red light in the middle, um, a white light at each of the vertices. And he could tell it was solid because it blocked out the stars. And it just hovered there silently. He drove under it sped up. He didn't want anything to do with it and uh, floored it and uh, all the way home after seeing this thing. And when I said, you know, you describe it as giant, well, how big it was it? And he said, well, it was about the size of a football stadium. So from his estimation, this thing was gigantic. And we will return to him the next day. But in the meantime, uh, people were seeing UFOs in the middle of the night, very early morning, right around 4 a.m. around Detroit Metro Airport. People, um, the witnesses to this said that the lights that they were seeing were strobing very quickly and doing these zigzag maneuvers really quickly through the sky, several of them. And they were clearly not normal aircraft. These are people that live in the area, work in the area, are familiar with what the aircraft looks like, and this clearly wasn't it. The crux of the sightings uh, is right where 94 and 275 meet up. That's the, the, the sort of the epicenter of where people were seeing these objects or lights in the sky. And that morning, uh, WOMC uh, uh, host Dick Pertman, Perton, pardon me, um, is uh, taking calls from people that listen to his show. And somebody calls and says, hey, did anybody else see these UFOs that I saw? And Burton says, oh, that's very interesting you saw UFOs. Hey, audience, if any of you saw a UFO, please call into the show. And a couple more people called in saying that they saw the same thing. So Burton takes it upon himself to call the airport. He calls Detroit Metro, and um, whomever he speaks with, he asks them, hey, Mr., did you happen to see anything? Do you know anything? Um, and he's getting no, no. And he's like, did your radar possibly pick up anything? To which he got the surprising reply that their radar doesn't go that far. So their radar from Detroit Metro Airport, the guy says, doesn't go as far as to where 94 and 275 meet up. 
So if you weren't afraid to, to fly before, this definitely, I think, would give you pause on that. Um, yeah. So returning to our original witness who had called, he said the next day um, he was um, in his bedroom, second floor of his home. He had just woken up from a nap of about, at about three o'clock still trying to quell the anxiety that he had from the previous night's sighting, still trying to figure out what it was he saw, still very upset by it. And he looks out his bedroom window and he sees on the top of, oh, moving over the tops of his trees, another UFO. This one is wedge-shaped, black, about the size of a car this time, with three little portholes on the side, no wheels, just flying over the tops of the trees at a speed, he says, is about the speed of a car. So it's moving at about 45 miles an hour over the tops of the trees. He's watching it, and he watches it until he can't see it anymore, uh, flying over the trees at the edge of his property. He's returned to his panic attack now, and it takes him several minutes to get up and get the courage to go downstairs. And he does go downstairs, only to find the thing now landed in his backyard, or one just like it, because he did lose sight of it. And it was right outside his window too. Um, I went to his house and I saw where he said this thing was, and it was just right there. So I, you know, I said to him, you know, about how long um, did you have this sighting? How long did you see it for? And he says, oh, about an hour. So I said, so you saw for an hour? Did you? call anybody and he's like no he goes after it was there for several minutes i didn't know if it was like stuck or had run out of fuel or whatever and if it had thought i was calling uh, for help it it might have uh, you know thought that was an aggressive act and come after me I'm like okay um did you take any pictures and he's like no he goes how was i to know that if i held up a little box in front of it it wouldn't think it's a weapon I'm like, okay, so what did you do? He's like, I sat on the couch and watched it, and I drew this little sketch, which he handed to me that he had done on a napkin, and I did this sort of mock-up of what it looked like based upon his napkin sketch. And uh, he said that another aspect of it was that uh, there was a red light inside of the object, and it was very gassy inside, and every once in a while he saw, he was sure, what looked like a, a childlike, uh, figure moving around inside of it and then after an hour of watching it he said it uh, got up cocked at about a 45 degree angle up to the sky navigated through the trees and disappeared so <coughs> when we were there we had brought along our antique uh, radiation detection equipment i like to call it and we went out to the backyard and went to the general area he said that this thing uh, went down the only thing was, when we got there, it was six months later, and there was about a foot of snow on the ground. So no way we were going to be able to detect anything. Uh, it may have left upon its immediate uh, landing. Also, we couldn't even tell if there were any depressions in the ground because it was under the snow. I volunteered to the witness. I said, hey, you know, um, I can come back. We can come back in a couple months and see if we can um, see any sort of depressions in the ground or anything like that. To which he replied, he's like, no. He's like, I am giving this to you. I am dumping this on you. I am not going to think about this ever again. This is your problem now. That was his approach to it. He was just like, don't ask me about it. Don't say you're coming back. Just take this, do whatever you're gonna do with it and never contact me again. And he was just unloading it on us to, to get it off of uh, his consciousness because he was really in bad, rough shape about what he had seen. <clears throat> and <clears throat> felt really bad for him because it does certainly happen that people see things like this and uh, it deeply affects them. Uh, curious part about his particular sighting is the craft itself. Um, Wedge-shaped, black, three portholes on the side. Um, we get obviously a lot of sighting reports in, but this particular type of craft was the first time I'd ever heard about that. Until um, November 20th, 2008, um, this event at 3 a.m. Uh, reported by a truck driver. Uh, he was a member of Michigan MUFON, 
and he said when he was driving his uh, truck through Oklahoma on that date, um, he was he found himself being paced by a black wedge-shaped UFO. This is his sketch. Um, he said, uh, yeah, it traveled about the speed of a car. And um, as it uh, paced him along the expressway, when the expressway turned, he turned with the expressway and the object continued to fly straight. Now, the one difference was is that he said this had square portholes and the other witness said round portholes. And maybe that's meaningful, maybe it's not, who knows? Like Jeeps, sometimes they have round headlights, sometimes they have square headlights. Maybe it's just a different model year, you know, to make light of the subject, but it, it was a very compellingly, seriously uh, a similar looking object. And uh, yeah, I got chills when he showed me his sketch. And the thing is, while you've heard about uh, some of the biggest sightings here in Michigan over the years, um, um, you've also heard from me that they keep coming. But with uh, roughly about 200 sightings coming in every year from Michigan, um, they come in from all over the state, all year round. The only slight bump in sightings that we get every year is just the, the tiniest bump around the 4th of July, understandably. But uh, for the most part, um, any given week, we'll get a one or two sightings reports in. Um, and this happens year after year after year. We keep getting these sighting reports. And the other thing is, is that a lot of people say, well, you know, what's the UFO hotspot in Michigan? Where are people seeing UFOs in general? Well, aside from those couple instances like the Southeast Michigan in 66 or West side of the state in 94, those were outliers to what we usually find, which is wherever there are more people, there are more sightings. We have this uh, software called uh, UFO Stalker, which is able to, you could ask it, say, hey, um, show me the last 100 UFO sightings in Michigan, and you always get a population map. It used to be they had the software set up so you could ask for the last 1,000 sightings. And with that many sightings, you can even trace the expressways through the state. And this is true in any sort of area that you ask for such information, any state, any territory, any province. Where you see triangles on here, they're triangle-shaped craft, uh, just represent everything else. And um, yeah, so people see stuff all year and people see stuff everywhere. And you know, we go back and review Fermi's paradox, uh, people saying, well, if they're coming here from another world, how come we don't have any evidence? I mean, I am up to my neck <laughs> in evidence on a daily basis um, accumulated over the years. So there's no question something's happening. And while our job within MUFON is to investigate and help people identify most of what they've seen uh, and we do a great job at that. Those still, still those few sightings that we can identify are, are the good stuff that keeps us coming back. Um, if you happen to see a UFO yourself, please report it to MUFON.com. If you want to investigate UFOs, um, go to MUFON.com and find out how. Also, if you are interested in uh, our local chapter and possibly even want to attend our upcoming meeting November 15th, um, visit mimufon.org, our state chapter's website, and find out more information about how you could attend our, our free Zoom meetings. When we can attend in person, we do, but until that time, uh, we continue to, to meet through Zoom. Um, okay, and Okay, so uh, thanks so very much uh, for attending tonight. If anybody should have any comments or questions or want to share anything that may have happened to them, um, certainly love to hear any of that. I had a question. Um, how do they determine, like, when they're going to send a jet out? You know, like, what they did that investigation for self. Uh, uh, up in Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. Who makes that decision? Like when all those were showing up over Lake Michigan, why didn't um, like the government send out airplanes to find out what was going on? Well, it's difficult to get that type of information um, because, first of all, 
um, the government or military in this case, the military would have to admit there was something worthwhile that they were going out for. They're not going to say why they dispatched some plane. They're not going to say, oh, we saw a flying saucer. We saw a UFO. So we had to investigate it. They don't even want to say UFO or UAP. Unidentified. Oh, okay. So we're, we're probably never going to understand when um, they make that call or why they make that call. And who knows, when you see jets flying overhead <laughs> in the middle of the day, maybe they're going between air bases, maybe they're chasing after a UFO. You know? it's, it's hard to say because they, they won't even talk about the subject, period. Thank you. Thank you. It was very interesting, by the way, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and if really there's good stuff in Michigan um, on record going back even to the 1800s, it's just that uh, I didn't um, you know, want to tack on necessarily another half hour onto the presentation. But yeah, people have been seeing stuff here in Michigan, it seems, as long as there's been people here in Michigan. I have a question. Sure. What? My name is Tom. I have a question. Uh, the question is, what is the strongest evidence for a physical nuts and bolts flying saucer, spaceship craft, landing on the Earth? Hmm. Um, there's a few things that, that come to mind, but the uh, Zamora case, I think, is probably uh, the one that uh, kind of takes uh, the cake on that one. My notes to, to find the uh, actual uh, date on that one. If I recall, that was, uh, yeah, it happened, oh, it's the, uh, April 24th, 1964. There was um, a police officer that was actually in New Mexico, outside Socorro, New Mexico, on that date that uh, he was in his patrol car and he sees a landed dome-shaped UFO on the side, off the side of the road. Um, this person wasn't somebody that was considered to be, uh, you know, a believer or into such things or whatever. And certainly in the 1960s, people didn't talk about this subject nearly as much as they feel free to today. And he was a law officer, you know, he was, and he saw off to the side of the road, this landed dome shaped object with two little guys walking around outside of it with large heads, childlike bodies, large heads. And when they realized that he was observing them, they scrambled back into their little dome bullet. Thank you. I would like to mention something. Sure. Uh, my husband and I had viewed um, a documentary a couple weeks back, and it was called um, Missing 411, The Hunted. And uh, it was put together by uh, a detective that used to work on cases of uh, people that came up missing in the national parks. Mm -hmm. So I know since um, he did this documentary, he put together some books. But it's extremely uh, interesting, all these people that just come up missing in the national parks and they have no evidence of whatever happened to them. And like you said, this has been going on since like the 1800s. So it mm -hmm. was pretty scary. Yeah, Dave Platt, it's, he's actually, he used to live in Michigan. Um, I, I know him personally and uh, have had a, opportunities to speak with him at conferences. Um, and yeah, he, is very careful about how he frames a lot of these disappearances. Uh, in his personal opinion, uh, you can sort of read into it that he thinks that something highly anomalous is going on, but he knows that he wants to portray the data as scientifically as possible. And so to go there and, and say, yeah, it was alien, you know, or well, yeah, Bigfoot, you know, it makes it, you know, would just, would turn off people instantly, a large number of people. So he's very careful when he, when he puts in his arguments together. And it's very compelling that in some of these things, 
something clearly paranormal is happening to some of these witnesses. Yes, it was very interesting. And you're right. He doesn't tell you what he thinks happened. He just puts all the information out there and the clues and all the details. And then, I mean, like you said, it, it's pretty mind blowing, but um, my whole point was, I think people should be aware that this stuff goes on and not to go anywhere by themselves because it's usually one person that comes up missing, not, not a group of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Anybody else? Um, I was actually curious, how often do you go out and meet with people that have, you know, um, contacted you about something they've seen? Okay. Um, when you say me personally, um, I'm going to answer this question two different okay. ways. First of all, the way that most people report UFO sightings to us is online. They go to MUFON.com, they fill out the online report form. It goes to whatever state's chief investigator. And in the case of uh, um, Michigan, that's a gentleman currently named of Daniel Snow. And he will um, assign that particular sighting report to one of our field investigators. And when a field investigator um, gets the, the case, they'll reach out to the witness via email or phone, um, get the information. And, and it's rare that a sighting report requires somebody to actually go on site. Um, UFOs are usually one-off events and um, to go to that place, it's not like you're gonna expect to see it again. If it, it came, if it, yeah, if it comes close to the ground, um, then that's one reason to go out. If it's near enough like an airport or something that would seemingly be a possible contender for what the witness saw, and the best way to check it out is to go on site, then, then certainly. But if somebody says, you know, I saw a white ball of light do a 90 degree turn and disappear, yeah, there's not much value in somebody coming out to, to look at that. From my um, perspective, um, since I am out of that direct chain of investigation, although I monitor what happens with the investigations in the state, I get all the emails regarding the, the sighting investigations and step in when I feel I need to. The um, way that I hear about most sightings is meeting the witness first, appearing at conferences, um, having our state meetings and having the membership people join MUFON. Um, a lot of people join because they themselves are witnesses. And they say after a couple meetings, hey, guess what? I'm a witness uh, or at, at you know some sort of event and so, people lead in with me by, you know, face to face. And then um, I direct them and say, hey, you know, this is great, thanks for telling me, please uh, make a, a citing report so we can, um, you know, get this in our database. Um, I had a question for you, Bill. Sure. Uh, great presentation, really inf informative. Thank you very much. Um, how did you get into this? In all of us. <laughs> okay. So in 1989, a friend of uh, mine was uh, coming home from work. It was February of 89. Uh, she got off work at nine o'clock and me and two other buddies were waiting for her to get home so that we could all hang out together. And we're sitting in uh, my friend's Chevette at, in front of her house when this blue ball of light arced over our car at about the height of two telephone poles and then uh, turned into a white ball of light which zigzagged all over the sky and then that became a single red ball of light in the middle of the sky and then that disappeared as well. Uh, we didn't know who to tell and uh, one of my friends says hey you know maybe we should tell the police. Well, like for, We're high school seniors at the time we're like we're really going to tell the police we saw a UFO? That seems kind of brave. So uh, the other friend says, okay, well, let's go to Selfridge. We'll tell Selfridge, you know, the, you know, the National Guard base, we'll tell them. I'm like, really, you're not gonna tell the police, but you're gonna tell the, the military? And so we, um, we're at a loss for who to tell. When a friend of mine um, who was going to the University of Michigan, uh, um, she said, you know, why don't you tell the Center for UFO Studies, J. Allen Heinings Group? and they have their headquarters in the Chicago area. 
So on a trip out, uh, the visitor uh, went to uh, the Kufos um, office, met with uh, Dr. Mark Rodiger, and he said, why are you coming way out here to report your UFO? Why don't you tell your state MUFON chapter? I'm like, MUFON, what's that? So he put me in touch with uh, the state MUFON um, chapter. I spoke with a, a state director at the time, Shirley Coyne, was really impressed um, with uh, how she handled um, my sighting report. And this wasn't the only weird thing I've seen. So I told her a few other things and it was very, I felt very welcomed and uh, was able to talk to somebody about some of the strange things that I saw. And um, yeah, I, I was on board ever since. That was 93. I actually joined MUFON and been a member ever since. Thanks. I was just wondering years ago, they didn't have cell phones to take pictures. Mm -hmm. Are people that reporting now taking pictures now? Because everything's a cell phone. Yes, yes, absolutely. Is and, the evidence stronger that way then? Um, it can be, um, depending on, on the video. Sometimes, uh, I mean, admittedly, if you take a, a video of a um, weather balloon, I know that's, that, that's sort of a joke within the UFO community to weather balloon. But, but if you, seriously, if you take video of a weather balloon, it looks like a UFO. So, um, or people recently took a video of a, a blimp like the good tech legally, I mean, literally, <laughs> literally the, the Goodyear blimp was flying over a football game, I think about a month ago and people had all sorts of videos and pictures of it. And we're sure it was a UFO. So the video can be helpful uh, for sure. Um, if it's of something that that's truly anomalous. Now, besides this presentation that I give, the other presentation that I give on a regular basis is best recent UFO sightings, I call it. And no sighting makes it into that uh, presentation that I do if it doesn't have video or a photo or a super excellent illustration. And so I have a lot of cell phone video in those presentations. And I'm not talking this type of stuff that gets dumped onto YouTube and uh, gets dismissed uh, 15 minutes later when somebody figures out how they, they perpetrated the hoax. These are good videos. So if you like presentations on UFOs and want a presentation about best new recent UFO sightings with videos, maybe contact your local library and see if they'll have me back. Thanks. I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to clap and leave. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so oh, thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, have a I have a question. Um, why do you think the UFOs are visiting us and mm -hmm. uh, why don't they show themselves? Hmm. Okay. The reason I think they're here is because we're here. I think once we get our act together, maybe in the next hundred years, <laughs> it feels like at this point, um, to be able to go out and investigate other planets ourselves, Anywhere that there's life, I'm sure, sure that we'll, I'm, we're going to be drawn to those planets first and foremost. And um, we will probably have, much like you see in the Star Trek TV series, um, you know, sort of that prime directive uh, of non-interference with the locals. I think that if the, uh, the beings that may be coming and visiting our world right now, if they showed themselves like as a permanent fixture, like not just to a few witnesses here or there, um, but if they land on the White House lawn and say, we're here, you know, um, and, and, you know, there's no question anymore. I think it would mess up um, a lot of things about our, our planet. One of the things is just if they had uh, the ability to uh, provide free energy, uh, the uh, great chunk of the world economy would suddenly uh, have the rug pulled out from under it with no um, easy way to keep people employed or government stable, things like that. Also, if they possibly have health technology that's eons beyond ours and they suddenly say, you know, hey, you people are all living to like 70, 80 years old. Hey, guess what? With this pill, you can live to 500. And what would that do to uh, our world civilization? So I think it's baby steps 
I think to some degree, they're making themselves visible, um, coming close and possibly even visiting some people just to sort of keep them in um, conversation. So to get people used to the idea. And so it could be a slow transition because Otherwise, you know, our, our civilization would, would just completely change overnight if they were to make themselves known. So I, I think that it's a sign that they're benevolent, that they don't do something like that. They could have destroyed us a long time ago. They haven't. They could have made themselves um, um, highly known and messed up our economy and our, our way of living and whole civilization by now. But they haven't done that either. So it makes me think that it's frustrating that we have, we're in a, like a, a phase of our evolution where we can't actually experience them as peers just yet. That day is coming, but it probably won't be any day soon. Okay, anybody else, anything else? Could I ask another question? Oh, sure. Could you recommend one or two authors or a good website on factual information about UFOs? Thank you. Um, for certain, uh, MUFON.com is uh, possibly not surprisingly the, the website I could point to. Also, if you see anything uh, from the Center for UFO Studies, which I also mentioned, uh, that's a, another great uh, reference. Um, if you are into intriguing things, um, openminds.tv, um, I think is, is a great spot uh, for some good speculative information. Um, with regards to um, authors, um, there are uh, several great authors out there. I think uh, Peter Robbins, uh, somebody that I, I would look to right away. Uh, Leslie Keen has a wonderful book on um, people in the military. Uh, that come to mind right away. Um, if you are into the abduction phenomena, nobody did it quite like Bud Hopkins um, in, in that respect. Um, Stan Friedman always put out solid material while he was still with us. Uh, Kathy Martin is a great um, person to look at her books in terms of um, contact phenomena, um, just as a handful of uh, people I'd recommend. Awesome. Anybody else have any more questions for Bill? All right. Well, thank you, Bill, for coming with us and um, sharing. Oh. oh, no. All right. I don't know if Bill froze or I froze. Um, if it's Bill and you all can hear me, thank you for attending tonight's program. I did share a link in our um, chat to the- I don't know if I should wait for her. Oh, it looks like she's coming back. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what, I, did I miss anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like Jamie, Jamie disappeared for a second. Everyone hide. <laughs> okay. Um, well, if there's nothing else, then I'm going to thank you. Thank everyone for attending. Um, remind everyone that we did put a um, link in the chat. If you could click on that. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Brandy. Um, and leave feedback for us on tonight's presentation. And everyone have a good night. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you so much, so much Bill. Yeah, take care. All right. Yes, you too.